trying to make the mind quiet, trying to make the body quiet. There's lots of levels to that quietness. One means sitting quietly. But of course, it's not just the body that's making noise. The mind is chattering away. And just as when you want to hear something that's very subtle, you have to sit very quietly. If you want to hear the subtle things going on in your mind, you have to make, try to make the mind quiet, too. Focus it on the breath. Try to cut down on all the chatter. If you want to talk to yourself, talk about one thing. Talk about the breath. Ask yourself, is the breath coming in? Is it going out? When it comes in, how does it feel? Where do you notice it? When it goes out, how does it feel? Where do you notice it? Does it feel good? Does it not feel good? If it doesn't feel good, you can recommend different ways of changing it. Say, try a little longer, try a little shorter, deeper, more shallow, faster, slower. And find the rhythm and texture breathing that feels good for the body right now. If you're feeling tired, you may want to breathe in a way that gives you more energy. If you're feeling tense, try to breathe in a way that's more relaxing. You can talk about these things to yourself. That kind of chatter is not out of place in the meditation. It's called directed thought and evaluation which are two of the basic factors for right concentration. But otherwise, try to keep the mind as quiet as possible. Because you want to notice what's going on. And of course, what you're going to notice is that there's a lot of ideas floating through the mind. Sometimes they don't just float, they yell at you, or they whisper to you. And you can begin to realize that you have the power of choice. You can choose which voices to listen to and which ones to put aside. You don't have to believe everything you think. You don't have to obey everything you think. And so listen to those voices. You begin to realize how much they push your life around. And some of them are well-meaning voices and other ones are not so well-meaning. You don't know where you've picked a lot of these ideas up that you carry around inside. Now one of the functions of meditation is to give you a place where you can stand inside and listen very carefully and figure out where do these things come from? Where, and more importantly, where do they lead? If you listen to certain thoughts, where are they going to take you? As I said this morning, all too often a thought comes up in the mind. It's like somebody driving up in a car. You're standing on the side of the road. Somebody drives up and says, hop in. And so you hop in without asking, well, where are you going? Who are you? If we lived our lives that way, we'd be dead by now. But that's the normal way it is when the mind thoughts come in, you just go with them. You've got to step back and ask, well, who's, which thoughts really are my friends and which ones are not my friends? In other words, which ones are going to lead to your true happiness and which ones are not? That chant we had on friends just now, it applies both to friends outside and to friends inside. There are true friends and there are false friends. 
and you've got to figure out which which is which. And encourage the true friends. Notice the Buddha said, attend to the true friends earnestly. In other words, when you figure out that someone really is a true friend, you want to encourage that person. Cherish that person. Because true friends are hard to come by. Years back when I was in Thailand, John Fuang, my teacher, gave me the job of teaching new monks. This was after I'd been a monk five or six years. And every year we'd get a batch of temporary monks coming in. Because that's the tradition there. Young men ordained for about three or four months. And there's a textbook for them to study during their period as a monk. And towards the end, as they're beginning to think about disrobing, there's a section in the textbook on lay life. And one of the teachings is on what's a true friend and what's a false friend, because this is a big issue in life. We went down the list, just like right now. People who flatter you, flatter and control, people who you, your companions and ruin is fun. Those are false friends. And the true friends are the ones who in the textbook, they said, and people are willing to die in your place. And every year, the, the comment would come up is, there are no true friends in the world. And that's not the case. There are some. But you have to look carefully. Asking, where is friendship with this person leading me? And as the Buddha said, if you find someone like, cherish that person. We hear often that the Buddha teaches us non-attachment. Well, he teaches non-clinging. Clinging is a different thing. Clinging is when you hold on to something and create suffering. That, he says, is something you should try to understand. Look for the cause and let go. But in the meantime, you've also got the path. And that's something you should work on to, to develop. That's something you hold on to as long as you need it. You develop virtue, concentration, discernment. These things are your friends inside. And the same principle applies outside. When you have helpful friends, you hold on to them. You cherish them. And you try to be a good friend to that true friend of that person, too. So the question of holding on and letting go, the Buddha said, you've got to be selective. There are four noble truths to life. It's not that you let go of everything. The first truth, suffering, the suffering that comes with clinging. Okay, you want to try to understand that, comprehend it. The cause of suffering is something you want to let go. The craving that causes you to cling, that's something you've got to learn how to let go. And then there's a path, and that you develop. And to develop, you've got to tend to it, you've got to cherish it, you've got to hold on to it. It's like holding on to the rungs of a ladder. If you're trying to climb up a ladder, if you don't hold on to the rungs, you fall off. And even when you're finished with the path, and John Suat, the monk who founded this place, he said, even when you're finished with the path, as far as you're concerned, you don't need the path anymore, but you think of the people who come behind you. And how easy it is for weeds to grow on the path, how easy it is for the path to get obliterated. So you t still tend to it, for their sake. Same way with true friends. Okay, After they've helped you, it's not that you leave them behind. You show them gratitude, because gratitude is one of the most important lessons you can give to other people. It reminds people that there is something good in life, and that's something that really should be valued, because it is so rare. A 
That's friendship on the outside. Friendship on the inside. You want to be friends with your wise qualities inside. The thoughts that help you, that point you in the right direction. You want to learn how to encourage them. Again, meditation is not simply a matter of driving thoughts out of the mind. You first have to learn how to think skillfully. Just the conversations that go on the mind. Should I meditate? Should I not meditate? And all the voices that say, no, it's I'm too tired, I need my rest, I want to do something else. Ask yourself, are those your true friends? Where are they going to take you? And then learn how to encourage the voices that take you where you really do want to go. This is one of the basic skills in meditation. If you don't, can't master this one, then you can't do anything basic like sticking with a breath. For some of us, this is easy. We've had parents who encouraged us, and so we learned how to listen to those ways of encouragement. Our parents didn't encourage us. You have to learn how to train yourself to encourage yourself. This is part of what they call emotional intelligence. There was a swimmer years back. I've forgotten his name. He's an Olympic swimmer. And he was expected to do a sweep of all the medals in the swimming events. And he blew the first, the first event. And all the commentators will say, that's probably it. He's just probably going to go down into a tailspin. But his coach said, don't write him off. He's not that kind of person. And sure enough, he won all the remaining events. Because even though he, was, he could easily have gotten discouraged after the first event, he knew how to talk to himself so that he didn't get discouraged. That's what we've got to do as meditators. Learn how to talk to yourself so you can stay on the path. When things are going well, how do you talk to yourself so that you don't get careless? When things are not going well, how do you talk to yourself to give yourself encouragement to get yourself over those dry, passage, pass, dry patches? That's a basic skill in the meditation, learning who your friends are inside your mind and learning how to encourage them. The Buddha once said that friendship with good people is the whole of the practice. On the external level, that means meeting with people who can teach you the practice. Because without them, how would you know what to do? On your own, could you think up the path that the Buddha found? Would you have the stamina to stick with it? It's the example of other people who've tread the path. That's what keeps you going. On the internal level, it's your ability to figure out who inside your head is your friend. And to cherish that friend, encourage it, listen to that friend. That, more than anything else, keeps you on the path.